Welcome to another episode of Vacuum Labs podcast, Banking on Air. I'm your host, Helene Panzerino, and as ever, I'm never alone on these podcasts. And today I have two guests, I'm very excited to say. And the topic that we'll be delving into is embedded finance. Embedded finance, what is it? What influences it? What are the use cases? And what are the benefits? Embedded finance has been touted as potentially the thing that will change fintech as we know it. And fintech was the thing that was touted as changing financial services as we know it. So it could be one of those topics that has real weight. So before we get stuck in to all and all our subscribers get to hear uh, the journey, let's get some introductions. So today I'm joined by Nick Heller from Tomato Pay or Tomato Pay if you're in North America potentially. And Kevin Sefton, who is the CEO of Untied. Nick, should we get an introduction from you and tell us what the company is doing? And then we'll talk more about embedded finance. Thank you, Helene. I'm really happy to be here to talk about a really uh, exciting and important topic around embedded finance. So, uh, as you mentioned, uh, Nick Heller, co founder, CEO of Tomato Pay, a London based open banking powered payments platform that helps small businesses get better access to financial services. Um, we've been operating for a few years now, and we really have been on the forefront of open banking and PSD2, and uh, really excited to discuss this topic, which is hugely important to small businesses in the UK uh, and all around the world, which is bringing banking and financial services into the day-to-day -day operations of their business so they can get on with doing what they do best which is um, pursuing their passion to, uh, to create a, uh, a better environment for their communities um, through their chosen line of work. Thank you very much, Nick. It sounds like it's got some powerful uh, stuff to, to discuss today. Kevin? Hi, Helen. It's uh, lovely to be with you today um, and with Nick as well. I'm the co-founder of Untied. Untied is the UK's personal tax app and more generally a trusted layer between financial transactions, the tax system, and people. And we'll be seeing how that will be changing over the course of the next couple of years. And we're here to make taxes simple and straightforward for the majority of people who want to be compliant, but they're not tax experts. So our philosophy is that people should be able to manage their taxes compliantly and reduce the tax they pay by being an expert in themselves, not an expert in taxes. So there are a couple of big trends. Nick's already touched on open banking, and we use open banking transactions to start the gathering process of uh, understanding someone's tax position. And we go all the way through to submitting straight to HMRC. There's a big change which is happening in tax from April 2023, which is called Making Tax Digital for Income Tax. And from that point, anyone who is self-employed or a property landlord turning over more than £10,000 will be required to use new third-party software. And that's what Untied is here already recognized by HMRC to be doing. Kevin, it's, it's really good to hear it because I can imagine you both know that I've worked with like literally, you know, tens of thousands of SMEs over the last 20 odd years or so. And I can imagine the shivers that go down people's spine at the very uh, early stage or at the micro end of their business when they hear that they have to do things digitally from an HMRC perspective. Anywhere HMRC for the, for global viewers is, is the tax authority in the UK. But of course, anywhere you are in the world, when you are a small business, tax is one of those things. If it's not your forte... And as you said, Kevin, they have, and Nick, you've alluded, they have other things to be getting on with, like running the business. Anything that helps and anything that can draw on permission data to look at the analytics of that and to do something useful with it, reconciliation and, and tax as uh, an automatic thing has got to be good. So we've got embedded finance, we've got open banking, which is the regulation driving some of the ability to share the data, not just in the UK or off the back, of course, of PSD2 in Europe into the UK. And now we're seeing it obviously globally, open banking is, is uh, really coming on a, a pace. So we're, we're, and then of course, the impact on small businesses, which is something that all of us are passionate about. And we've seen at the end of the last year and some change, how small businesses have been now designated as the engine for turning the corner in a post-COVID world. And so we better come up with some good and useful things to help them do that, I think, right? Globally, they account for a large percentage of GDP. I think we all would accept that as uh, green, but how do we help them? So, Nick, again, we have a variety uh, in our listeners and our subscribers of levels of understanding in financial services. 
So maybe we can start off with what is the definition of embedded finance? Well, embedded finance. So it's a hot topic these days. And I think I'll start off with a very simple definition, but then maybe talk a little bit more about the drivers, um, similar to what uh, Kevin mentioned. So firstly, I think we're all used to doing financial services. It's a hugely important sector of the economy. Um, and, you know, banks are literally too big to fail because they play in a very important role in everything we do as individual consumers to uh, business owners. Um, and that's really to store value, to hold our cash, to help execute payments and move money around and to do lending. And traditionally, we would, um, you know, get up out of our house and walk down to the high street and go into a branch and do banking. And that was everything from, you know, depositing money to uh, making a payment um, through to applying for a loan. And it was a very active activity. You would actually have to physically do it. And I think embedded finance talks about moving financial services into the background where it's more passive. And I think although banking is hugely important, it's not something that everyone aspires to do. Unless you work in the industry, actually, if you're a small business owner and your job is to be a landscape architect or to be a contractor or a plumber, you want to spend your time actually you know, getting more customers, doing more jobs. You don't want to spend your time doing the admin associated with running a business. Um, and so, you know, very simply, embedded finance is about moving from a very active role in administering financial services and actually running a business, or even as a consumer, actively seeking out financial services to a more passive operation where it's embedded in your day-to-day -day life. It's embedded in your day-to-day -day life as a consumer, as you're going about your day, you're actively engaging with various aspects, various people, and financial services can be embedded at the point of need. A short example um, could be on the consumer side, as we see sort of the growth of the internet, the commercial internet, and ultimately technology and the internet of things, which we've heard a lot about over the last 10 years. You open up your fridge, you realize that actually you need more milk. And if the fridge is connected to your supermarket, then you can purchase some milk immediately right there via the internet. That, in my mind, is an embedded financial services transaction as a consumer. More importantly, in the topic at hand that we're discussing as a small business owner, if you're actually a landscape architect and you're just finished a job um, at one of your customers' houses, you'd want to bill that person immediately. But generally speaking, you actually have to go back to your desk. You have to create an invoice. You have to align that with the contractual terms and then offer that over to your customer. And there's a lot of back and forth and a lot of friction. What embedded finance can provide is immediacy. And at that point of relevance, in this case, as you're walking out of the house, you're, you're thanking your customer, you're actually able to request the payment immediately. They're able to pay you. They're able to get that information directly into their own hands. And you're able to get that information reconciled, ultimately doing some of the magic that Untied and Kevin do. Um, you're able to understand the tax liability around that. And all of that is happening in the background while you're going about your day-to-day -day operation. So, you know, in short, it's about embedding financial services into the day-to-day -day life of an individual or a business and being more passive um, and removing that friction and ultimately helping helping everybody. It's interesting because listening to you, and when I or we started this, I, I mentioned that people are talking about embedded finance as being the thing that will disrupt fintech. It wasn't fintech when we set out, when we used the moniker in 2011, 2012, for example, wasn't it meant to be real-time, transparent, seamless? Don't we always say this is supposed to be, you're not supposed to know that it's happening, right? It's supposed to be efficient and transparent and cost-effective and happening in real time. And in a way, this embedded finance is bringing us to the zenith of what fintech was set out to be when we all started down this road. So it seems to me that they kind of go hand in hand. And actually, this is the pinnacle of what fintech could be. So it's uh, it's it's interesting that some people are putting out a sort of a potentially doomy gloomy situation when actually I think this is a great situation for it. Well, we're about to cross the chasm, I would say, into the mainstream because of internet penetration, because of the fact that 
you can embed financial services into everything that we do, which, you know, actually brings us into the enlightenment time of fintech, which is actually everyone can become a financial services provider without being a traditional bank, which has a massive, you know, cost associated with it, not only in terms of regulation, but also in terms of setting up that type of operation. So this actually, pardon to use another buzzword, but it sort of democratizes and it's distributed financial services that can be anywhere. So I think this is actually a great time to be in quote unquote fintech. And um, we're just sort of about to cross the chasm into mainstream. And it's a really exciting time. Okay. I want to come back to two things that you mentioned. One is this non-financial institutions getting into this. And, and as Andreas and Hor- Horowitz put out in their blog, I think it was, everyone's becoming a, a fintech. And then I also want to start to speak about the impact or the potential impact with incumbent banks. But before I do that, Kevin, Nick mentioned that, let's take the example of the person that's coming out. They've done some work for you. They're the carpenter, the plumber, et cetera, whatever they are. And, and generally speaking, you know, there's always been a lag in terms of small businesses and micro businesses in particular. So the the sole trader, the self-employed person getting paid and it causes a cash flow problem. So presumably what you're doing is actually going to transform this part of the MSME or MSMB market. And also just to get your take on how open banking is helping to enable this. I think the contextual side that Nick really sort of highlighted is the important thing and embedding this at the point of need. And I'm hearing in that scenario that you just described, two really important points of need. The first one, if you are the tradesperson, you're going to have invested potentially in subcontractors, you're going to have uh, materials that you've bought and so on. Now, there's a potential need to make sure that um, at the time that you go and purchase these materials, or that you're paying your subcontractors, that you've got the cash flow that you need there. And one of the things that really strikes me is I often get invited to take up loans at a point when I'm just not interested. And to be honest, at the point when my bank balance uh, is going up and down, I'm not fully on top of it to know exactly when I need it. But here's a really good example. I've got a contract. It's evident. I've got a customer who's going to be paying me. I may have payment terms. Being able to make sure that I can fund and support my subcontractors and various other things within that network. And of course, the second thing is at the point that I complete the work and I then put on a payment request to to Nick, who I've done the work for. And then suddenly Nick might have a need to say, well, actually, my cash flow is a little bit tight at the moment. I need to be supporting myself here. And all of that, of course, from a lending perspective can be backed up by evidence that you're going to be seeing through transactions through through open banking. I think the ability to collect that payment really quickly is so important that we waste so much time re-entering bank account details. You repeat it over the telephone. The speed of the ability to make payments using the sort of technology that Tomato Pay has is really quite exciting. And I just sort of, I guess, also want to touch on some of the tax things that will have happened as well in the background. So if I'm in the construction industry, I may have subcontractors and various documents need to be filed in relation to my payments to them. Again, all of that can be tracked behind the scenes invisibly for me as a tradesperson using some of the transactions that we're seeing going through the bank account. And I think that's very exciting in terms of removing the day-to-day admin that someone needs to do as a a tradesperson. My passion is likely to be that I'm a carpenter, a plumber, not that I enjoy doing my paperwork. And we often see people really worrying about how they need to be getting on top of this admin. And the more we can be taking advantage of the data that already exists, I think the more powerful this is. And for these these things just to happen automatically in the background. Kevin, can I ask you a question? And you, you mentioned the data. And, and again, I can I totally appreciate where this is coming from with the, the angst that is around doing all the tax and all the, the reconciliation behind it. Is there any element of, and this is going to sound potentially like a, a silly question, but is there any element of data in has to be correct and accurate for the data out to be the same? I'm thinking about back to using other tax systems, online tax systems that I've used which are a bit more complex than just the, an Excel spreadsheet, and watching people enter data, and it was garbage in, garbage out, because they didn't know how to actually set up the categorizations to get it correct. So the dashboard became useless, and anything else that was coming off the back of it was relatively useless. Is there any element of that that we need to consider? Is there any education that, that the business owner needs to have or the sole trader needs to have to get this right at the, at the point of entry? The short answer is, of course, 
you need to make sure that the data which is coming in is correct and is appropriately categorized. But I also think there is an opportunity coming back to the analytics to help people get things right. That if we know the sort of trade that you're likely to be in, we would have a very good idea, the sort of level of profitability that we're likely to be expecting. So if for some reason something's been mistagged, we're likely to be picking up that sort of thing. And Nick was talking about the democratization process here. At the moment, the tax authority has access to this sort of algorithm. So they know whether this looks reasonable from their point of view. And I think it's incumbent on the system as a whole to be sharing that so that we can be helping people make sure that they are staying aligned. We do see there are people who willfully want to take advantage of the system and simplifications. And this is not for them. This is for someone who wants to be following the rules, doesn't have the expertise to be able to identify certain things, but we can help them and guide them along the way with contextual information, questions that we'll be putting to them at the right time. So instead of a long form that you might set up at the start of a process, if a transaction comes in, they will be able to wizardize effectively solving that and getting that right. But there is a categorization paradox, which I just want to pick up because I think in the context of open banking, it's important, which is most categorization looks at the nature of the merchant. For the work that we need, and I think the next generation is actually about contextual categorization relevant to the individual. So that if we all go to IKEA and buy something, and I'm a tradesperson, I'm buying that as materials. Helen, you've got a property that you're renting out. It's part of your property costs. And Nick has just bought a beautiful new bookcase for his living room. It's the same transaction, but has got a different context and relevance to each of us. And making sure that we get that right is important, but the best time to get that right is at the point of a transaction being made, not many, many, many months after the end of a tax year. Because I'll be honest, if I look at my receipts or if I look at my bank statement and I see a transaction with IKEA 18 months ago, I'm really at a bit of a push to try and remember what it was that I bought. So let's do it while it's fresh in our minds. And I think that's one of the most exciting things that people will always be on top of this and know what they need at that point without shops coming later on in the day. That's very powerful, actually, for me. I can see that there's a great benefit there. Nick, I want to go back to, to something I said. I wanted to talk about the incumbents because I'm listening to the payments. I'm listening to the two of you working together in certain ways. So if I'm the incumbent bank, if I'm the, you know, the large high street bank, am I getting sidelined in all this conversation? Well, I think um, there's a few different ways that we can look at this. And I think in some senses and in some ways they are. But it's also up to them, because if they want to actively participate in the evolution of financial services, then they won't be sidelined at all. And so I will bring it back to the end user again, and then incorporate the bank, the high street bank, the incumbent banks into that process. So an example of what tomato pay brings is the idea of this quote to contract invoice. So supporting a service person, a trades person, as they're developing business in their in the initial communication with their customer, how they're providing a quote, which then turns into a contract, which then ultimately turns into an invoice. And if you're helping them with that process and you're removing the friction from that process, you're doing them a service so they can get on with doing their job and ultimately earning more income and revenue. But in addition to doing that, it also means they have greater visibility on when they're going to be paid. You can apply the categorization to the data on their side and on the consumer side, which then makes sure that you're properly able to analyze it. And, you know, importantly, as Kevin said, you're able to apply tax treatment to that. Now, if you're a bank, if you're an incumbent bank and you're offering a service like that, it opens up a wealth of possibilities. Not only are you better engaging and servicing your customers by giving them the opportunity to gain time back by using a very sophisticated yet easy to use invoicing platform, but you're also gaining interesting data and intelligence on those customers. So not only will you see that they're going to be paid in 15, 30 days time, You'll see the transaction, you'll see the tax treatment around that, you'll see that data point, and you're able to offer financial services to that customer then at this point of relevance. 
at this moment in context, do you want to finance that invoice before it arrives? Do you want to take out some sort of a merchant cash advance and repay a loan based on future revenue? All sorts of opportunities arise with embedded finance. And so if you're an incumbent bank, you likely have a whole lot of customers already. You likely have, you know, hopefully a healthy balance sheet where you can do more lending, but you're not currently embedded in the day-to-day operations of your customers. And so this gives them an opportunity to actually be very value add, offer a win to the end business, the end consumer, um, offer a win to the incumbent bank who can put their balance sheet to work by lending in a faster, more efficient way because they have better access to data and ultimately have a better view of risk and lower risk when you're doing things like revenue-based finance. So I think the opportunities here are huge for incumbent banks, but it's their decision of whether they want to participate or whether they want to sit on the sidelines and, and use the traditional methods of banking, which we know are becoming increasingly outdated and are very expensive. So don't actually add to the profitability of being a bank. That is fascinating. And I think that really puts it very succinctly as to how, particularly for the segment that we're looking at, the SME, the SMB of a certain size, not the large, larger corporate where the, the banking arrangement might be different, is giving, in this case, we'll talk about the incumbent or the high street bank, a leg up, an, an actual leverage to be more productive, to be more efficient, to get more money out the door, and actually to empower the relationship manager, if there is one, and it's not just a, an automated group somewhere in the middle of the country like mine is, I'm just saying, Um, (laughs) if there's an actual human being that you can speak to, they get more insight from the data as well as me as the business owner. And it becomes a relationship again. And we've kind of gone a little bit back in time to relationship banking, which is what it was Mm. back in the day when I started out. And you knew the person. And we see this, obviously, in the smaller banks in a more community or in a mutual or in a building society where, generally speaking, we know we have a relationship. And that was that trusted relationship has come back to the fore again during the last year saying, you know, these people knew who I was and it wasn't just all automated. And there was an element also, I think, of of, what Kevin was speaking before, of AI and machine learning coming into play because the more you get to see the transactions in a certain category and a certain level, you can start to, to read and predict where things might actually sit, not in terms of the the financing they need, but also what the HMRC people will expect. And that is super powerful because over time, I can remember back many years ago saying to taxi drivers, HMRC has a rough idea of what you earn. So if you take a lot in cash and you don't take a lot in another way, they're going to know. You know, and it was always a kind of mental striking of the balance, but actually you'll get it very clearly here. So that's fantastic. And do you think that with alternative lenders as well, so some of the alternative finance platform lenders came into being when incumbent banks were not able to or wanting to, whether it was for uh, regulatory reasons or for risk reasons, to lend to this fragmented uh, risk of, you know, all the things that you could say about SME lending. Uh, these, these came to be, are they going to to find that it's um, if incumbents get more power or get more back in the game, that this will impact their lending? Or should they also be getting on board with this? I think to keep up with the times, everyone should be on board. The alternative lenders sort of gained prominence after the last financial fallout of 2008. But if you looked at their early business models, primarily, they were just a lender that slapped a website onto what was a traditional lender and became digital. They weren't encumbered by the legacy technology, so we're able to utilize some ways of adding efficiencies and lowering costs of how they would originate and service a loan. I think that's evolved, though, and I think that both them and incumbent banks are looking for partnership routes to leverage what they have, which is essentially you know, a balance sheet they're able to lend, um, and embedding themselves through any number of different partners so that you're in the day-to-day life and operations of a business. The incumbent banks obviously will always have an advantage of a lower cost of capital. So I think there is a little bit of a threat there uh, from alternative lenders, but alternative lenders have just been traditionally faster and, uh, and better at lowering their costs and in turn have, have been faster to adopt these new technologies like open banking and others. I think that the playing field is starting to become a little bit more level and that the banks, as they lower their costs, are able to go down to the smaller sole traders, micro SMEs, 
because their cost of origination and servicing is lower, as a result, they can get you know profitable at that sector. And that's going to impact a lot of alternative lenders. But so, so I think everyone has to be thinking about using technology like tomato pay and untied um, and embedding themselves in the day-to-day life of these businesses. That's, I think, just the, the trend that is not going to stop. It's only going to increase. I wish that people could see what's the excitement that's happening inside of me, even though we're just on the airwaves, because this is very exciting. I don't want to put a damper on it, but I want to ask a question about non-financial institutions in this space, because there are online marketplaces that we have our data and have our trust to a certain extent. And if it comes up in the transaction to do something, you know, am I likely to do that? If it pre-approves me for something or lets me uh, buy now, pay later, but I can start the process now and it's happening in the transaction, it's happening for real, as you said, and we discussed that that would be FinTech uh, at its at zenith. Are they a threat or are they a partner or they, where do they fit in all this? I think they're a huge partner in this. I think there's a significant opportunity for all of these platforms from many, many, many different perspectives. And your question there was really, I think, a little bit guided towards the financial services, but actually there's so many things which are happening in terms of, of compliance and the need to make sure that that is actually dealt with at the point where it's actually relevant. Now, we're talking about fintech, but whether it is compliance in terms of product compliance, uh, electrical regulations, product regulations, we're all buying stuff from a global marketplace today. And I still want the absolute assurance if I'm buying something which is advertised in a certain way, it is going to be safe. And particularly if it's something maybe that children are going to be playing with, is it a toy which actually complies with all the regulations? And embedding that in that marketplace is going to be critical. And the same applies then to all the financial services that exist on the back of it. And I'm going to give you a little bit of a parallel. If as a business, I'm buying things from a marketplace, in theory, what I would like is that transaction automatically landed on my against my VAT um, account, and it landed against my, um, my P&L. And The data can flow if we want it to flow. And I think what we'll find is that the marketplaces going forward that are really working to the business community will find that this data moves in a much more streamlined way. And I don't even need to do anything, but suddenly it's there appropriately categorized. The tax claim is made and that's good for me as a business. And it also happens to be good for the tax authority. And on that note, the tax authority often has to now collect money. We're obviously in a post-Brexit world, but goods coming in and out of the country, making sure that that is done in a way where the tax authority gets the money that they need to allow the goods to flow through the border as quickly as and seamlessly as possible. And it does strike me that one major software supplier, I'm dotting around a little bit, one software supplier that we use over the course of the last 12 months, the tax treatment of the services they've supplied to us has changed three times. So if that's changed three times, just for one business, how many other things are there that we need to be keeping track of? And I think the platforms are a great place to be doing that, whether that's Spotify, whether that's eBay, whether it's Amazon, whatever it could be, or um, some of the big B2B platforms. And I think it's tremendously exciting to be getting that context there. Can I also come back to your question about banks? Because I think one of the real challenges for banks is the SMEs that Tomato Pay and Untied and, and others are really focusing on sit between two stools in these banks. We're not proper large scale business customers who are happy to have a relationship manager pay however much money a month for business banking services, which we can't quite identify the distinction and we get a little plastic thing, a card reader, which is all very complicated. And yet what we want to be doing is we want to be using our personal current account to be managing what starts off as a hobby, becomes a side hustle, and then may become um, self-employed activity at a larger scale. And the banks are very awkwardly uncomfortable about that because they say, well, you're not really meant to be putting business transactions through your personal current account. It's against the terms and conditions. So I think the opportunity, whether it is for new entrants or for incumbents, really sits in this space, which is going to grow between a business account and a personal account. And those that succeed will be the ones that offer services that are relevant to those in that space. And I think it's too early to predict where the hook is going to be. It might be your bank account. It might be a shopping platform. It might be a card. It might be that you are 
literally looking to make a payment um, request and you come straight to Tomato Pay and you see that explosion that starts around Tomato Pay um, and other services because of that. And I think it's going to be really exciting to see where these hooks actually are over the course of the next couple of years. It's a very good point because it is like no man's land, isn't it? In terms of a bank, you, you don't want to overpay for something that you don't need if you're not of the size. And then you get all muddled by using your personal credit card, your personal cash, trying to extract it from your personal account, put it in the right categorization to do your taxes. This is like an age old problem, right? It shouldn't matter. It shouldn't matter yeah. which account it is. And I think that's yeah. the key thing. Philosophy in the past was keep things very separate. And now we can, it's really exciting. You can intermingle it and then suck out the data using the technology and the analysis to make sure that we identify what is relevant, whether it's something to borrow against or it's something for other admin purposes. And why are we still trying to gouge businesses for fees when there's a 22 billion pound funding gap in the UK and a 4 trillion pound funding gap globally? They need, they want a loan actually so that they can grow. And if that's where you're gonna make higher margins anyway, and that's the core of what you do, then I think that fee business where you're gouging should just go away. And to answer your point, in my view, I mean, I think it's a huge partnership opportunity for incumbent banks. I mean, you see Goldman Sachs with Amazon, you see Goldman Sachs with Apple. Those are maybe a bunch of 100-pound gorillas dancing. But the same thing goes if you're uh, Spotify, as an example, you see who's a hit maker um, and you see the trends happening with those artists. You're not a lender, but you may be a broker. And actually, in this world of embedded finance, we could also call this connected finance. And maybe who it's going to disrupt is the, you know, the brokers, because the brokers, the, that sort of, you know, intermediary, do they really need to be there? Are they changing because they're actually embedded finance offers this solution, whether you're, you know, a taxi marketplace or a food delivery service and you have all these different sides, the consumers, the sole traders that are working for you, the businesses, you have all of these different elements that is just flowing through and seeing that data that you can actually broker a bunch of different services, whether it's tax or lending or other things. So I think that's the real exciting part. If I'm a bank, I want to do what I do best, which is lend and have a balance sheet and find the opportunities of where these customers are. Like now, if we go back to what I said in the beginning about saying this is very disruptive, this is really game changing. And I think for our listeners and our subscribers, now you have a much better understanding, I'm sure, of what it is, what the power of embedded finance or connected finance is, where all the stakeholders and partners and players along the way can benefit, where they may have to make some conciliatory noises, take a bit less but also empowering the business owner, be they a sole trader or a very small business as well. This to me is a quiet revolution. And I'm so glad that the two of you are working together to make this happen. I feel quite privileged to know you all. And I think we should all have that same feeling in, in listening. So I think we're up at the, nearly at the top of the hour. So it remains to say thank you to Kevin and Nick and to encourage all of our listeners to stay tuned because we may revisit this topic again. Subscribe and join us on all the usual channels. See you next time. <laughs>